This morning, I want to read the Christmas story to you from uh, Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And this is kind of a traditional Christmas story of which many of us are familiar with. And it begins here with these words. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who had pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. You know, that's the story with which many of us are so familiar, and it's, it's such a beautiful story. It's, it's such a, a cute story in so many ways, and we've just got, uh, when we read the story, we have visions of little porcelain nativity scenes in our minds as we read about that first Christmas so long ago. We even write songs about, so many songs have spoken about that, great Christmas songs that we sing over and over again, silent night, holy night, all is calm. All is bright. It's so cute, isn't it? It's just so warm and fuzzy. And yet, I want to tell you, there's only one problem with the scenes that we normally paint of that first Christmas. And it's this. There's no poop in that scene. There's no poop in that scene. And if we were to talk about the real Christmas, it would not be quite so clean and cute uh, as we typically make it. In fact, we have rewritten a few of the lyric, lyrics to one of your favorite Christmas songs that would maybe be more, a little more realistic toward that first Christmas. So, listen to this. Thank you very much. 
<laughs> it almost seems wrong, doesn't it, <laughs> to do that to Silent Night. And yet that's the truth. When we talk about that first Christmas, listen, it wasn't a porcelain nativity scene Christmas. It was chaotic, it was messy, and it was scary. And when we read the Scripture, the Scripture doesn't say those things, but all the kind of things that we typically envision about, uh, about Christmas, that first Christmas we come, we picked up from these songs we've written that, that make it sound like it was also sweet and cute when it was anything but that. We have these pictures of that first Christmas of, of a lamb gently nudging Jesus' cradle, rocking it to a steady beat of a baby that never cries. And that's not how it was. Here's the Christmas story. Caesar was about to place an unfair tax burden on the Jewish people. And so he's forcing everybody to leave where they live and to go back to the places where they come from. So Joseph packs up everything he owns and he takes an 80 mile walk to Bethlehem. He, he takes along Mary with him, who's a young teenage girl who he's betrothed to but not supposed to have had relations with yet. And yet everybody can see that she is already pregnant uh, and they have already endured much scorn and much condemnation. They go together, they take this 80 mile walk to Bethlehem and when they get there, Mary goes into labor. They look for a place to stay but they can't find any place to stay. The only place they can find is a barn-like cave place. It was probably more like a cave than a barn. It was a place where people kept their animals. It was nasty. It was stinky. It had dung on the floor. It was a place where they kept animals. And when the baby was born, uh, they placed him in a cow feeding trough, some place none of us would ever dream of placing a newborn infant. It wasn't clean. It wasn't sterile. It was the only place she had to place him. She didn't place him there because it was cute, because it fit a little portion of the nativity scene. She put him there it was because the only place that she had. There was no doctor. There was no epidural. Listen, I've been there when two, two babies were born to my wife, and she had an epidural, but I will tell you, it was still not a silent night. Uh, <laughs> it was anything but calm. It was anything but peaceful. Some of you have been there. You understand what it's like when a baby is born. And can you just imagine Joseph and Mary in a strange place in a barn. There's no clean white sheets to be found. There's no, there's no baby room to suddenly stick him into that's been perfectly decorated for him all these weeks. This, it's this chaotic, messy scene into which Christ is born. Anything but what we typically have envisioned Christmas being like for most of us. Jesus left paradise. Jesus left heaven. That Jesus left, left the Father. I mean, the wonder and the majesty of, of heaven where, where angels are singing constantly, praising God all the time, 24-7, that place where it's just filled with beauty and light. Jesus left all that, and he plopped down right into the middle of a great, big, scary, chaotic mess. That's what that first Christmas was like. For most of us, that's anything, anything uh, but like our Christmases are today. I mean, think about how much energy you and I spend on making the perfect Christmas. I mean, we, we spend a lot of time and energy trying to make Christmas perfect, don't we? We hit the mall. I mean, there were people at the mall yesterday. It was filled with people at the mall yesterday shopping for the perfect gift. I'm thinking, why are these crazy people here? I mean, who would go to the mall on the Saturday before Christmas? It was crazy. That was the silliest thing I've ever seen. You know, and yet we shop and we hit the stores to find the perfect gift. We go to the, the grocery store to find the perfect turkey. We walk these huge lots filled with trees to find the perfect tree that won't look really silly when we bring it home and put it up with that curved trunk. Listen, we, we, we do all these things. We, we make people in our houses. We make them clean and scrub and vacuum so that we can have a perfect house when company comes over so that we can have a perfect Christmas. But when Jesus came, when Jesus came, it was anything but perfect. Is anything but. Jesus plopped down into the middle of that great big mess. He didn't come into a perfect situation. Uh, and, and unlike you and I, Jesus chose where he would be born. I mean, most of us, we didn't have a choice about it. Wherever we were born, we were just born there. Jesus had a choice about how he would be born. He could have been born to the wealthiest man uh, in Bethlehem or Jerusalem or whatever. He could have struck down Herod and been born in the palace. Jesus could have been born in Superman's ice castle. 
<laughs> if he had wanted to. He could have chosen to be born anywhere. He, had cho- he could have chosen to skip infanthood altogether. He could have skipped the diaper rash and the mashed up vegetables that probably aren't that good. He could have skipped it all. But he didn't. Jesus chose to be born in Bethlehem, in a cave, a place that was built for animals, and to be put in a cow feeding trough. And it was no accident that he was born there, for it fits perfectly with the mission of Christ. When Jesus, later on in Luke, when Jesus is describing his mission, what he came to do, he says here in Luke chapter 4, he, he says this, he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to pray, proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus says, this is what I came to do. I came to seek those who are lost. I came to seek those who are oppressed. I came to seek those who feel like they're so far away from God that there's no hope. Jesus said, I didn't come to seek those who are perfect. He said, I came to seek those who have issues in life, whose lives are messy. I came seeking those who are far from perfect. And so Jesus was not born into perfection. He was born in the midst of a mess because he didn't come seeking perfect. He came seeking you. He didn't come seeking perfect. He came seeking you. And for many of us, when Christ found us, he found us in quite a mess. For many of us, when when we encountered Christ in a powerful way, in a transforming way, for many of us, when we encountered Christ, we were in quite a pickle, right? I mean, it, maybe it was a broken relationship, maybe it was a lost job, maybe it was at the depths of addiction, uh, whatever it was. For many of us, it's, it's in those moments when life is most messy that God finds us there. And the scripture says that that's what God came to do, and he proves it. God's willingness to enter into our mess is proved from the very beginning at this birth story when Jesus comes, not into a Norman Rockwell painting, not into a porcelain nativity scene, but Jesus plops down right into the middle of a mess. That's, that was his mission. It's what he came to do. Uh, my younger brother and I were out trout fishing one day on the Little Red River. We were wearing our waders, and we had put in at the swinging bridge, and we were, we were walking along the bank trying to kind of get away from some of the other people, and we, we walked down a little ways, and, and uh, I was in front of him walking down the river, and I, I stepped into what I thought was just some soggy ground. It ended up being a big, giant mud pit that I stepped into. And, and when I stepped into it, I mean, at first it wasn't so bad, and I kept going. But, but in just a, a couple of moments, I find myself in mud up to my waist. And, and Tommy was a couple of steps behind me, so he was not quite up to his waist, but he was about right here. And, and suddenly, we found out that both of us were stuck. I mean, I couldn't move. I, my, my waders were sucked up to me, and, and I, I couldn't pull myself out. I couldn't push on the mud and get out. And Tommy only has a leg and a half from his automobile accident, so he wasn't that much good, especially in waders. And, and, and so he was stuck there, and, and I was stuck here. And, and, and so it was kind of funny at first. Ha ha, we're stuck in the mud. This is really funny. Until you begin to think about the fact that on those rivers, like the Little Red, the water comes up really quickly when it comes up. And when the water comes up, it doesn't come up a little bit. It comes up six to ten feet. And so we, stuck in the mud, began to look at each other thinking, this is really kind of funny unless the water comes up. And we were both stuck in our waders, stuck in the mud, thinking, how in the world are we going to get out of this? And so we tried and tried, and yet we couldn't find any way to get out of the mud. And, and there wasn't anybody around that was going to listen to us if we screamed. And so there we are. And, and so suddenly I came up with a great plan. I said, Tommy, here's what you need to do. You need to lean over face down into the mud towards me and lie down with your face, in the, and then I will push on you, and I'll have some leverage, and I will climb on top of you and work my way out of the mud. And Tommy looked at me like a younger brother looks at his older brother when you come up with a plan like that. 
I said, really? I said, it's the only plan I could think of. We had no other choice. I mean, that, that was it. And so Tommy finally, uh, that versus death, that sounded good. And so that's what Tommy did. He, he kind of leaned over into the mud and just kind of fell down face first in the mud. And then I climbed on top of him, pushing him down into the mud as I did. And I, I was able, because he just kind of spread his body out, I pushed down on him and I was able to get myself out of the mud and the muck. And, and I got over there and then when Tommy came, he came holding his breath, he came up out of the mud, he's just covered. I mean, just it's down his waders now. It's all over his face. It's in his hair. I mean, I just stuck him in the mud as I crawled out. That was funny. And and, and then you know, and I and I got out of that. And as I read the as I read the Christmas story again, and, and I reflected on exposing Christmas for what it really is. You know what? That picture of Tommy came to my mind again. That picture of Tommy in the mud, just covered from face and body, just covered in the mud. That that picture of Tommy suddenly reminded me of the Christmas story. Because my help came not from somebody who was standing on the bank telling me what to do. My, my help came from somebody who was in the mud with me and who gave themselves to the mud so that I could get free from the mud. And, and you know what? When I began to think about the Christmas story, that's it. That's the Christmas story. It's God's willingness to climb into the mud with us. When we get behind the perfect Christmas tree and the, the perfect turkey and, and the perfect gifts and the perfect house, the Christmas story is about God's willingness to climb into the mess with us. It's the story of a God who doesn't wait for us to get our mess cleaned up before He comes to us. It's the story of a God who doesn't wait for us to get cleaned up and straightened up before He comes to us. It's the story of God who climbs down into the middle of our mess with us. And when he's with us in the middle of our mess, God says, I'll show you a way to freedom. I'll show you a way to life. You see, many of us have this mistaken notion of, of what our relationship with God is like. See, many of us think that God is up here. Maybe that God is up here. That God's up here hollering directions down to you down there in your mess. Saying, here's what you need to do. I gave you the Bible. Follow the instructions and come up here with me. And then you and I will hang out together. That, and we think that's what God's telling us to do. But that's not the Christmas story. The Christmas story is that God comes down here. God doesn't wait for you to clean up or straighten up. God comes down here with you and he climbs into the mess with you. That's what Christ did on that first Christmas. He says, this is what God's willing to do. He's willing to come down into the mess that is your life and say, listen, we'll get up there, not because you're going to come to me, but because I'm going to come out here and I'm going to be with you. God is going to come and enter into the mess that is your life. And there's the hope of Emmanuel. There's the hope. If God is with us, who can stand against us? If God is with us, what can stand against us? If God is with us, what can hold us back from the life that God wants to give to us? That's the hope that God enters in to the mess of our lives. Doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter where you are on your spiritual journey, doesn't matter what your life looks like, what you're addicted to, God's willing to enter into the mess that is your life, that he might draw you, not so he can hang out with you there, so that he might walk with you into this life that is really life. There's this, uh, there's this sign where we used to live on the highway. If you're, going, uh, if you're going from Little Rock to Hot Springs on I-30, there's a great big sign on I-30 that one of the churches has erected. And the sign says, Warning, God is coming. Warning, God is coming. I mean, that's kind of how I read that. And, you know, I get it. I mean, I, I guess I kind of get that sign. But I think, you know what? That's really a horrible sign. Uh, it, it, it seems like it makes the coming of God a threat. And you know what the sign ought to say? Instead of saying, warning, God is coming, the sign ought to say, rejoice, God is here. God is here. God has entered into the mess of your life. Wherever you are, whatever is going on, and, and for all of us, our lives are messy somewhat. God has entered into your life. And said, I want to walk with you. I'm not waiting for you to clean up, straighten up. He's, he's, he's come to you. Emmanuel, God with us. That's our hope, that God is with us. Rejoice, God is here. That's the message of Christmas. Let us pray.
Gracious God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for your great love for us. Lord, I just praise you and thank you that you haven't left us in our messes, but you have come. Lord, and you demonstrated on that first Christmas so long ago your willingness to enter into the chaos, your willingness to enter into the mess, your, your willingness to enter into uh, a less than perfect situation. Father, we just thank you for that, Lord, because for all of us, our lives are less than perfect. Lord, we struggle. We've got, we've got things we're, we're working on. We'd like to be different. We'd like to be better, but... But, Lord, we continually struggle. And I just thank you that you have, have, have just given us this promise of Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, I, I just pray that that would sink in. Lord, that you're not waiting uh, far away, but you've come all the way to us. That you, you've taken us by the hand. You allow your power to be made present to us. You allow your grace to be made present to us today. We don't have to wait till we clean up. We don't have to wait till we straighten up. We don't have to wait till that relationship is fixed. We don't have to wait till we overcome that addiction. Lord, you have come to us to offer us your grace and your love and your hope and your life. And God, I just pray that that would sink in, that we would feel the hope that comes from knowing that you are with us. And God, if you are with us, nothing, 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 will keep us from the life you desire to give to us. We praise you and thank you for that in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.